I'm Jessica Palvino of the Drone Advocates, and we are here this evening with Jean Robinson, um, pioneer and legend in the world of UAV search and rescue. Um, Jean is the owner of both RP Flight Systems Inc. and RP Search Services. RP Flight Systems Inc. Uh, was incorporated specifically to produce economically viable flight platforms. RP Search Services is a 501c3 organization that provides UAS technology to assist in search and rescue recovery operations on a charitable basis. Since 2005, Jean has utilized small UAS, UAS to assist Texas EquiSearch in searches from California to New York, visiting 29 states in the Union. He also has conducted UAS operations in Jamaica, Mexico, and Africa, and has assisted search and rescue teams in recovering victims that were lost for lengthy periods. Jean, uh, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. We're really happy to have you. It's my pleasure, thank you. Um, can I just jump right into the, to the hard questions Absolutely. Here? <laughs> um, so can you first tell us why did you decide to pioneer the use of drones for search and rescue purposes? It was kind of a sideways move into the search and rescue end of it. As we developed our unmanned aircraft, we wanted a way to educate people and we wanted it to become very visible. And one of the, the avenues that we sought out was search and rescue because it was such a benefit. Uh, we knew that there were many hardships that uh, uh, search teams had to go through to walk through the woods and walk through areas that were very rough and, and uh, wet and, and dangerous. And we thought that perhaps our unmanned aircraft would assist in that. And it became a bit of a passion after the first couple of searches that we went on, especially when we helped locate one of the victims. Uh, that was pretty much the hook that set, and it was uh, off to the races from there. Uh, so how many victims have you personally been involved in locating with your search and rescue operation? Actually, we're up to a dozen. Uh, we've had 12 so far, and uh, those are only the ones that uh, I count that were directly attributed to the unmanned aircraft. We've been on many, many searches where there were uh, uh, assists, if you will, where we provided uh, on-time data very early on in the search that aided the, uh, the search coordinators and the search teams that had to go out there and actually do the searches. So uh, uh, many, many more of those that uh, uh, helped in the recovery of victims, but we don't count those because I'm only keeping up with the ones that uh, my little airplane went out there and found. And tell us about your little airplane. What type of aircraft do you use? The Spectra is a flying wing, that, uh, which means that there is no tail and no rudder and elevator. It's just a full flying wing only. Uh, and it's been around for a while, but uh, the design came from a NASA paper that was written in 1969 on flying wings. So we started from that and uh, started developing in early 2000 the use of flying wings and we adapted it and modified it so that it didn't fly fast, it didn't do aerobatics, it didn't do a lot of fancy tricks. It was designed to carry a payload that would go out and find a victim. So Jean, can you tell us why it's important to have emergency management training um, to prepare yourself to assist with search and rescue missions? One of the things that we've discovered as the industry grows is that many people feel like they can go out and purchase an unmanned aircraft and poof, they become a search and rescue pilot. Uh, and that is not the case. There is a very structured sequence for searches. There is a hierarchy for the command and control of a search. Uh, that is typically under the National Incident Management System or ICS, Incident Command System. And that provides for uh, asset control, it provides for communications, which is so very important. And it provides a procedural guideline for people to operate under as they go through the search process. It's very important that people understand 
that even though you see a search with a lot of people out there and it looks very disorganized, there is a method and that method needs to be adhered to. Now, do you use any imaging, uh, image processing software to scour the images? One of the things that we've done in the past is we tried to make imagery available through the easiest possible way. Uh, if we have to hand over imagery to an agency who is doing a search, they need to be able to use it on their computer. So we started out with simple things like uh, Windows Office uh, Manager for you know, viewing pictures. We are currently working with uh, some very smart people in California to do object and color detection. And this is going to be a huge boon to the, the search and rescue industry. Uh, for example, it's what do you wear when you go out in the woods? It's typically blue jeans. Well, blue doesn't occur naturally in, in uh, most circumstances, and you can have your computer look for anything that's blue in a picture. And uh, that, that's a very kind of a high level view of it, but uh, when you have two to three hundred images and you're trying to use a standard issue Mark I eyeball to go through each one of them, having a computer do that for you and pre-qualify them is just a tremendous time saver. What are some of the challenges that search and rescue drone operators face in the field? <laughs> Search and rescue drone operators have to step up and meet a wide variety of environments. Uh, you have to interface with a wide variety of people and personalities. Uh, but more importantly, you are asked to push your aircraft as far as you can push it because typically there's a life on the line. And you have to consider that your aircraft is expendable because there is no aircraft, no matter how much you paid for it, that is worth a life. And you need to get that mindset before you go out into the field, because you will be asked to push it a little bit further and a little bit farther to try to make the difference. And what are some of the challenges that search and rescue drone operators face, uh, in your opinion, in the legal realm? Currently, we're going through a, a very wild and woolly time as far as legislature is concerned and, and legal activities are concerned. Many of them are based on emotion. Uh, I hate to say hysteria, but uh, there are so many people that have a misunderstanding of what an unmanned aircraft is capable of. Uh, there are many people that believe that uh, it, can, it can see your face, it can read the newspaper on your dashboard of your car, it can do so many things, and that's just simply not the case. Uh, and, and much of the, many of the laws that have been passed have been based on that sort of misinformation, which is unfortunate. And we need to turn that around. We need to put some science back into it, and people need to understand that there are very many benefits to be derived from this technology. Um, can you tell us a story about um, one of your more memorable uh, search and rescue operations? Well, the, the ones that make the most impact on me are the kids, you know. Um, all of those are memorable. Uh, I, I guess one of the, the, the ones that is the most humorous for me is uh, I got contacted by a lady uh, who had lost her llama. And the llama was pregnant and needed some medication, so I reluctantly agreed and went out and flew and I said there's no way we're going to find this llama, it's a huge area and uh, by the time I got home my partner had located that llama in the pictures. So we went on a little llama herding thing, you know, late that night, but that was, that was one of the most comical ones. Well thank you very much Gene, we really appreciate you being here today and helping to educate the public about all the great uses that drones have in our world. My pleasure.